Okay. We're recording. Okay. The time is now uh, 10.30 hours on uh, 27 December 2000. Interview with Mr. Alton A. Dubois, Jr. Uh, the interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Von Hassel, and the location is the Latham Headquarters of Division of Military and Naval Affairs. Uh, Alton, tell me a little bit about where you were born and grew up. I was born in East Portchester, New York. And, uh, they, uh, then I moved, I li lived in uh, Westchester County most of all my life. And my grandfather had been a, a quite a land, land supervisor in the, in the Rochelle Water Company. And uh, I went to school in Eastchester High School and uh, met my wife in, in, in high school. And uh, after that, uh, I got several jobs with, with radio stores and things like that. And uh, after I, after the, the uh, in 1939, uh, the radio stores uh, <laughs> fired me because he couldn't afford me anymore. And uh, so uh, I joined the, uh, the 102nd Engineers at Fort Washington Avenue in New York City. And uh, we drilled. We drilled on the floor for a week, and uh, all of a sudden we were federalized, and we shipped down to Alabama to Fort McClellan. And uh, we spent a couple of months in uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama, and then they uh, shipped us out to maneuvers in Tennessee. And uh, when I went out to Tennessee, I was a uh, truck mechanic and uh, uh, driver, and you name it, and uh, general. KP operator and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And uh, after the Tennessee maneuvers uh, were over, we shipped back to Alabama again. And uh, then we, a little while later, we shipped out to, to Louisiana and we had the Louisiana maneuvers. And uh, the uh, Louisiana maneuvers were the uh, same as everything else in my maneuvers. And, I got some funny stories about all of those, all those areas where the, the, on the Tennessee maneuvers, one of the generals in, the, in charge of the, the, the command that we were in <laughs> got captured. Well, how'd that happen? <laughs> he wasn't paying much attention to what was going on, and, uh, and he, <laughs> he found out that uh, the troops were right around, all around him, and mm -hmm. his, his headquarters were captured. <laughs> and he was quite embarrassed. And uh, during that time, I was also put in the map division. And uh, uh, the map division people, they had a whole group of people making the, the maps for the, for, the, uh, for the commanders and uh, putting a, a plastic layover over the top of the, the page so that they could write on it with ink. And uh, these fellows were, these fellows were uh, spreading out the whole sheet of elastic Paper, uh, plastic, and laying it down, and having to roll out all the bubbles. So I, I, I suggested, why don't they just put one edge down and peel it off as it goes over the map, and it'll go over with no, no hole in it. Well, that's not the way we do it. So um, I got transferred all of a sudden. <laughs> and uh, after the uh, uh, maneuvers were over, uh, well, I went back to, to uh, Camp Claiborne. And uh, then they, they, I knew my, my enlistment was due, and uh, they called me in and, uh, and gave me my, my discharge, and I shipped home. And after I got home, my mother was surprised to see me, and uh, so I, I uh, didn't have nothing else to do, no radio jobs available. And so uh, I heard that Pitney Bowes was hiring for uh, all kinds of uh, lab work, and uh, being electronically knowledgeable, I, uh, they put me right into the uh, inspection department of uh, bomb release solenoids. And uh, I was a final inspector. I had made, made all the inspections and testing and checking. And uh, while I was there, uh, I re-enlisted in the uh, engineer reserve because I knew I'd either get drafted or something. So. Uh, I uh, decided I, I wanted to stay in the engineer reserves. So I went down and I re-enlisted in New York City. And uh, in January, I got called back to the service. And I went out to Yaphank, Long Island, and all the fellows that were there 
that uh, had been discharged at the same time I was, was all there. They finally, they called individual names and uh, shipped them out. And they called my name and uh, they, they said, well, you're going to go to 7-Eleven Railway Operating Battalion. And I said, how come? As all the other guys are going back to the same outfit and rank they were in before. He said, well, you re-enlisted, so we can put you anywhere we want. <laughs> so they gave me a ticket and, uh, to go to, go to, uh, to uh, Louisiana, and uh, I had instructions on uh, where to transfer on the railroad, and that we on the middle, it was very Pacific, and they got me off at Bringhurst, Louisiana, and I put uh, a little whistle stop. Nobody there. And I stayed stood around the station about two hours waiting for something to happen. And finally an MP came along and he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I, I just arrived here a while ago and I was supposed to go to the 7-Eleven Railway Operating. But he says, come on, I'll take you over there. So he took me over there and, uh, and uh, I signed in. <laughs> and in my introduction to the captain and uh, the first sergeant and that, the first sergeant was reading off my qualifications and my specifications, and he said, so much face pay, so much longevity. And the captain looked at me and said, longevity, where'd you get that from? <laughs> I said, well, I had one year before. Oh, so he said, what do you know about railroads? I said, only to ride them. And uh, he said, okay, here's another supernumerary for you, the first sergeant. And uh, I spent a little time doing KP duty and guard duty and you name it. And finally a, a call came out for a bulldozer operator to, to, to build the railroad that we were working on. And we went out in the uh, Louisiana fields and we, we ran uh, a whole line of uh, track from Camp Claiborne to Camp Polk, 50 miles. And we built stations, we put telephone lines up, we built bridges. We uh, filled in the uh, drawer and uh, all kinds of uh, operations. And uh, we connected the Missouri Pacific Railroad to the Texas Pacific over in, in Pol Fort Polk. And uh, the Fort Polk people, uh, we had uh, stations all along the line. And uh, on one of the lines, I was, I was in a, working in the station, and. Uh, I uh, took care of the, the power plant. We had a, a, a diesel engine running a power plant. I took care of that and operated it. Blew out a bunch of lights once in a while. <laughs> and uh, after, after a while on the railroad, why, uh, we suddenly saw a diesel locomotive with camouf camouflage on it. And we figured, well, we're going to go somewhere where there's desert. And uh, we didn't know what it was because all we had was steam locomotives. And, uh, our guys had to learn how to run that locomotive before we went overseas. And so we got alerted and uh, we, we shipped out on the railroad and we went to uh, Bayonne, New Jersey. And they put us on a, a ferry and took us over to uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and put us on the West Point. And uh, our colonel was, uh, was smart. All the people who arrived early started filling up from the keel up. And we wound up on the A-deck, <laughs> right underneath the pom-poms. And uh, the, uh, we pulled out on, on December 31st, uh, October 31st. And uh, nobody realized we were moving until some, one, one guy woke up at night to about 12 o'clock and says, hey, we're moving, because you just barely feel the roll. And uh, everybody settled down. and. Uh, we were told to stay in our bunks whenever we heard the battle stations signal. And uh, we, we, we had, they took that Liberty, that the beautiful ship, the cruise liner, they ripped it all apart, they tore out all the petitions, and they put in a three bank, three bank beds uh, on central posts, and uh, it was a bed on this side and a bed on this side, six of them in a, in a row. And, uh, that's where we lived for, for <laughs> the time, 30 days, we took about 30 days. Our first stop was, was Rio de Janeiro. Oh. And uh, we took on fuel and uh, fuel and oil and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the sailors were unhappy because they weren't allowed any leave in town. 
and we pulled out of Rio and uh, the next stop was uh, around the Cape up to Bombay and we'd taken off to West Point in Bombay and in Bombay uh, we had to wait and the ship pulled over to one side of the canal and uh, the tide went out and the ship bellied up on the mud bank and it started to list and started to list a little bit more and the captain was gotten <laughs> had gotten a little bit frantic he had everybody on the ship get over to the high side and uh, finally the tide went out and we we uh, uh, went into port and they gave us uh, they gave us four hours of, of leave time in in Bombay dirtiest city I've ever been in and uh, after we came back to the ship they said well you're not going on the West Point anymore you're going on a British intercoastal liner so we got on a, a liner called the Romer the Roma and uh, it was a typical uh, British ship and uh, I made friends with the I made friends with the radio man, of course, because being radio knowledgeable, I made friends with the radio man and uh, went up in his, his radio operating office, and uh, I was introduced to the chief engineer of the, the ship, who was a British officer, and uh, he uh, said, "If you want to come down in the engine room, it's fine with me." So I went down in the engine room, and I had two big, triple expansion steam engines, and Indian troops taking care of them. And he said, you stand by this post and don't move. He says, whenever that signal goes off, he says, stay there. Get out, don't, don't get in the way. Because those guys will knock you down going to their, to their job. And uh, I, he took me all around the ship and I went down and followed the, kind of the paper, the uh, propeller shafts all the way down to the back of the ship. And these great big propeller shafts that's big around. And, uh, we arrived in Bombay. We were seven. We had we, we were about seven days. It took us to go up the Persian Gulf, and uh, on the Persian Gulf trip, the ship was operated by uh, British uh, officers, but the crew was mostly Hindu and Sikhs. And the Hindus were deckhands, and the Sikhs were the fire firemen running the engines, and. Uh, they had a they had a, a, a commissary on board, and you could buy fruit and things like that. And uh, all of a sudden, we saw them getting our meals ready, and they came out with a with a, a half a half a cow, and they laid it on the deck and chopped it up with an axe and threw it into a, a pot, big pot. And uh, then the next day, they did the same thing with a great big carp fish. They laid it on the deck and chopped it all up and threw it into a big pot. And uh, we slept in hammocks on that ship all, all the way out. And uh, that uh, was something. We landed in Bombay. After we landed in Bombay and, and got on that ship, uh, the circumstances changed considerably from the, the quarters we had on ship. And uh, after we got to, to Kuramshah, we got off the, the boat in Kuramshah, and there was nothing. The English had uh, their camp there. and. Uh, the, uh, the, our advanced team had not arrived, and no, there was nothing, no provisions, no, no quarters, no nothing for us. And uh, there we were, in the, standing in the mud, waiting for somebody to do something. And uh, the Foley brothers, a, 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 a private contractor, was out there building roads and uh, things like that. And they gave us their Christmas dinner, and they, they provided us with some tents. And we slept on uh, plastic mats and things like that in these tents. And uh, the mud was so thick that after a while, after a while, you'd walk around with these heavy boots on with mud all over them, and uh, you sit down and you scrape the mud off your boots, and you feel like you're going to fly again because uh, you felt so light again. And uh, we stayed there about a week, week and a half, and we started to mosey into the railroad to look over the what was going on, everything like that, and uh, what the operation was. The British were operating the, operating the road, and they were running approximately one or two trains an hour. And uh, their dispatching office was one, in one big office. Everybody was on one big room about the size of this auditorium. 
and uh, everybody had his own desk in the, 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 the bare room and uh, the bedlam in there from everybody yelling on the old telephones. The, old, the only telephones we had were uh, mechanical crank-ups, magnetos. And uh, so after we looked that over and uh, that we, we decided that I was supposed to be a switchboard operator and they decided to, that there was no switchboard so well, they, they changed my MO to a station agent. And the first station I went to was 80 miles down the road towards, towards uh, Khoramshah, a, a, a terminal. And uh, uh, there was three GIs, three GIs and, and four uh, Iranians and their wives. And uh, they were in like a, a motel type building with uh, four big rooms. The switchboard, the telephone and the terminal was in one room and the other three were the, for the quarters. And uh, here we had our, our rifles and everything with us and uh, so we, <laughs> we were three scared guys out there with nobody around but the Iranians. We didn't know anything about them, we didn't know their language or anything like that. And uh, eventually we got to know them and, and were friendly with them and pretty soon the uh, the engines would come along and uh, it was strictly a, a, a flag type operation. The conductor would get a flag from his starting point and he would fly, he would travel to the next station and surrender the flag to the station agent. And uh, the station agent would get on the telephone and call the next station ahead and give him back the flag and he would continue on. And uh, if there was any wait to be done for another train coming south or something like that or north, why uh, he wouldn't give him the flag back and he couldn't, he had to get over on the siding. And that went on for about uh, oh, three, four weeks. And uh, so we, everybody, everybody got moved around every once in a while. Uh, I, I was at that station for uh, a week or so and uh, then I went to another station uh, north of Ahwaz. Ahwaz was our central central point. And north of Ahwaz, I went to a small station the same way. And uh, eventually I got to know the Iranians better and know their customs. And uh, I'm, I, I was always interested in, in languages and things like that, so I, I started learning language. And what we would do was, I, draw a picture on a board on a piece of paper and uh, the man I showed there would be a rifle and the Iranian would say ah too fine and then they would uh, I draw a picture of a pig and they say ah graz <laughs> and, was, and uh, that was a pig and they didn't eat wild boar out there and the place was full of wild boars and uh, we took our took our rifles went out in the desert I didn't do it, but some of the guys did took their rifles, went out on the desert, and they shot, shot gazelle and uh, wild boar, and that was our fresh food for a, fresh meat for a while, until uh, our fresh supplies came in. And uh, we had one team went out with a, a, a jeep and a 50, 50 caliber machine gun, and they were shooting a wild boar, because these wild boars were tough, tough birds, and you shoot at them with a 306 and uh, we just bounce off their, their shields because they had big plates on their, on their shoulders. And uh, the only way to kill them was to get them running uh, away from you and uh, shoot them in the rear end. And uh, one of the bullets in a 50 caliber machine gun was an explosive bullet. And they were big all over the desert. <laughs> and <laughs> so a after we uh, uh, did that, why, uh, I worked a half a dozen different stations in the in the line, and uh, one of my uh, last stations was the what we call the South Yard, the Northern Division. The Northern Division uh, was the last re re last uh, divi uh, station on that division that was in the desert. The rest of it, from that on, was all mountains, and uh, those mountains were something else. The grades were uh, three to six percent, stuff like that. And uh, in order to get the locomotives up some of those mountains, we had to, we had to couple uh, three diesel locomotives together. And we had jumper cables in between. I say we, but people. 
and uh, we'd uh, go up through the through the mountains, carrying maybe 50 cars of, of load, and uh, that because that was about all that they could carry on those grades. And uh, we had tunnels, tunnels, and tunnels, and trestles and tunnels. You'd come out of one tunnel and jump across a trestle and go into another tunnel, and. Uh, uh, we went, I, I usually rode the locomotive when I was going on trips. I had an A-pass, so I'd go anywhere I wanted most of the time. I, I apparently was a good boy. <laughs> and uh, one of the engines, one of the engineers uh, in the station uh, in, the, in the northern mountains said, now you, you go out on the platform and you look down on the side. And uh, he said, when we come to a couple of openings in the tunnel, you look down and you'll see a couple of locomotives down there where they were going too fast and went over the side. And uh, these, these, this railroad was built by the Italians and the, and the Germans. The Germans supplied the, the running gear and the equipment and the Italians built the tunnels and the roads. And uh, the uh, one station had five passes before it got to it. Zigzag back through, the, through and through the mountains. And uh, when you got up to the top, why, there was this little station, and, uh, and, and that was it. Sepatash was the name. And uh, after we got into Tehran, why, uh, there was the big yards and all of the, the uh, pronunciation of the uh, uh, civilian outfits and uh, the, all the military outfits, the railroad yards. And uh, I still cringe whenever I hear the radio news, uh, news people say, Tehran. Or Tehran. It's not Tehran. It's Tehran. And uh, they used to pronounce it uh, Kramshaw, was uh, Kramshaw. <laughs> all these all these American dialects. And uh, I still cringe when I hear some of these announcers on the radio pronouncing mispronounce these Iranian names. I learned a small amount of uh, Iranian language while I was there. And. Uh, the, uh, they, they were very friendly people. We had no trouble with them whatsoever. Even uh, in the towns, they had, we had no trouble with them all. And I used to go into town and uh, uh, sit down in a, in, a, in a little tea room outside tea, tea house. And I, and I would uh, tell the waiter, Billy Man Chai, and that's bring me tea. And they would bring me, bring me uh, cups of tea and uh, maybe some bread, something like that. And uh, the uh, the Iranians were they were they were they were more in awe of us than anything. Was, there was no animosity whatsoever, as far as we knew, from anybody in the Iranian government or the Iranian people. And uh, as long as we observed their circumstances of their religion, we didn't go into their churches. We didn't uh, interfere with them when they were praying or anything like that. And uh, that was told to us very very strongly. And uh, one of the things that uh, we were told also that we were not a, an uh, occupying operation, that we were an accompanying operation. We worked one-on-one -on -one with them. And uh, we had no, no difficulties with any of, the, any of the, the people. And I had more, more fun riding boxcars with Indian officers and uh, Indian troops and a uh, couple of Englishmen, and uh, 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 there was a, a Russian, and uh, we get talking uh, to each other in various languages, and uh, sign languages, and drawing pictures, and you name it, uh, for communications. And uh, there was no, never any, never any problems at all. And after we, after we. Uh, finished operating the, the, uh, the whole operation, we got notified that we were returning to the States. And before we, in 1940, before we returned to the States, they had an opportunity for us to go on a furlough. And some of the fellows could, some of the fellows uh, took a furlough and they could go back to the States for a month, or they could take R&R &R in a, uh, a line camp along the way. And we found out that the the trip to the States was too long, and uh, uh, we found out that the R&R &R, uh, at the camp he did nothing but guard duty and coat KP anyway. And they also had an offer that we could go to the Holy Land on a, on a trip. So we got on the, 
I said we signed up for the Holy Land, and uh, and, uh, and the fellow and I, who was, who was a company clerk, uh, he he and I he and I signed up for this Holy Land trip, and we went to Bond, we went down to Bandashapur, and uh, not Bandashapur, down to Karamsha, and we got on a boat and we crossed over the the, the Shatalara River into a little town of Basra, and in Basra. We got on a narrow gauge railroad with all the uh, natives and uh, Indians and all kinds of animals and you name it. And uh, we were on this narrow gauge railroad and we went up to Baghdad. And from Baghdad we got on uh, army uh, six by six trucks. And we rode five days across the Transjordan Desert and uh, uh, into, into Israel. And uh, in Israel they, uh, they put us up in a post and we had, uh, we had 12 days allowed in, the, in, the, in that area. And the Cook's Tour Company had uh, uh, regular tours and they took us all around the, uh, the area in, in, in the Holy Land, all of the Holy Sepulchre and all, all of the places. My wife is jealous because she, she'd love to go there. And uh, after 12 days we uh, got on uh, trucks again and instead of going back through the way we came through northern Transjordan, we went right back through uh, the Dead Sea area, Jerusalem, uh, Dead Sea, and the whole works, and uh, up into, uh, into uh, uh, the capital of, of Jordan, Amman. And we visited several places in Amman where the Romans had built cathedrals and they had built various uh, uh, buildings and that. And uh, we went back through that area and back out, about it, back out to Baghdad, and same route back again, and uh, that was that was quite a trip. And uh, while I was out there in uh, in uh, in uh, Jerusalem, no, yeah, in Jerusalem, uh, we visited the main city of of uh, of, uh, of uh, getting old. I can't remember the names anymore. The capital city of not not Jerusalem is huh? Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv. And while we were in Tel Aviv, we we were went down up and down Allenby Drive, and uh, Allenby Drive every every third store was a camera store. Because all of the Jews that got out of Germany, they couldn't take any money or anything like that, so they took took cameras and uh, all that kind of stuff, equipment, and. Uh, they were selling cameras like nobody's business over there, and uh, I bought a I bought a, a, a neat little Voigtlander uh, film pack type camera, and uh, I found out that the PX had a surplus of that kind of film, and nobody else was buying it, so I had a, a run on that kind of film, and I took all kinds of pictures. I got uh, dozens and dozens of pictures that I took over there of various things on the railroad and things like that. And uh, after we came back to the service, to the, uh, to, to the railroad, we operated the railroad for a while, and then we were notified that we were going to be shipped out. We're going to, after Europe quit, mm -hmm. we were going to be shipped out. So we spent most of the time down in Karangshaw repacking our equipment. Some of the equipment we didn't repack, we took it out to a, go, a ravine and dumped it. And uh, we were taken over to Abadan Airport, and we put on a couple of, we were put on a, 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 a DC-3 and we flew to Cairo and uh, we stopped over there for uh, overnight and then from Cairo we went bouncing across northern Africa and you could look down and see all the tracks of the original battles that were in northern Africa. We landed in, we landed in uh, Algiers and Oran and all those other places. We finally wound up in, in uh, Casablanca and in Casablanca uh, we were put in his post and uh, we were told, you stay within hearing distance of that loudspeaker that's on the pole. And uh, he said, when your name is called, uh, you get your gear and go to, to the post, to the office. And they put us on a, 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 they put us on a, 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 a transport plane. It was, it was a bigger plane than the, the, the DC-3. And our next post out of Casablanca was uh, the Azores. 
we flew into the Azores and landed there for fuel and all that kind of stuff and uh, rest, get out and rest. And uh, we were told that you had to get back on that plane at a certain, certain hour. And that was it. If you didn't, you were AWOL, period. So uh, we got on a plane and uh, the, the pilot on the, on the plane taking off from Azores, he says, now we've got a short runway here. And he says, if we don't make the runway, we're going to be in the water. <laughs> this was fun. So uh, we, we didn't hit the water. And we flew on and uh, we finally, the pilot said, if you look down there, you'll see those three little dots down in the water there. That's Bermuda. And he said, we're going to land there for, for fuel and uh, space. And uh, so we landed there. We had 45 minutes while well, they free fueled the plane and everything like that. And we weren't allowed to go anywhere. We would just stay right there off, uh, off the plane but on the ground. And uh, we took off from the, the, uh, the Bermuda. And the next flight, we came in. We came into New York, and we came through the clouds. And when the Statue of Liberty popped out of the clouds, and we could see it, I don't think there was a tear eye in a place on the plane. And we landed in in uh, uh, LaGuardia, and uh, they took us over to Fort Tilden. And <laughs> at Fort Tilden, we were put up there for a couple of days, and we were. We were told uh, we had furlough home for 30 days. And don't you know that they took out every telephone in the place? There was no telephones left anymore because they didn't want us to use the telephones. So we were given tickets and sent home for 30 days. And uh, we were classified, we, went, we flew home because of the fact that we were a Class A railroad outfit. And we were destined, uh, we, were, we, we flew home on what they call the Green Project. And at that time, the Green Project was uh, specialized troops for the planned invasion of Japan. And we were supposed to take 80, 82nd Airborne Training in parachute troops to uh, be prepared to jump into Japan and take over the railroad functions. And. Uh, of course, while I was home on furlough, the bomb was dropped. And uh, I was down in my dark room developing pictures, and I came up, I heard the rumpus upstairs, and I wondered what, what was going on. And my mother says, hey, the war is over, the war is over. I said, oh, that. And I went back to the, my dark room. See, you know, most of the GIs were so, uh, I don't know what you, hardened, that uh, nothing, nothing changed us. And uh, I went down to my dark room, and after a while I came back up again, and everybody was parading and having a big time over it. And I wasn't that excited. Oh, this is the, I'm glad it's over. And, uh, but I had to still report back to camp. And I reported back to uh, Fort Jay. And uh, they, they shipped us down to uh, Camp Stewart. And in Camp Stewart, uh, they, uh, they told us that we were going to be, be processed out. In there. And, uh, and Camp Stewart was uh, the, uh, the, 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 this was after, after Japan quit, of course. And Camp Stewart was uh, the uh, place where they, they gave us the or physicals and all the checkouts and everything like that. And they had a graduation. We had a bandstand and the band was playing and uh, that we had to walk up on the on the band and get our our discharge papers and things like that, and we hired a we hired a we got about 25 of us hired a, a, a bus out of Fort Stewart, and uh, this bus was going to get us to to uh, Savannah, uh, and we were supposed to catch the six o'clock train to New York, and of course this was four o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, <laughs> we told the, we told the driver that there's a ten buck. Ten bucks uh, from from each of us if you get there by before six. Um, boy, we had a rough ride <laughs> on that bus, and we got on the uh, the, the train and uh, we made the train and we got on in and I arrived in New York and called my mother from from uh, Grand Central, and uh, <laughs> she was so surprised. And when I got home, I uh, I didn't uh, have a job or anything like that. And, I, I decided I was going to take a, a year off and do nothing. 
I got sick and tired of looking at myself. So I went out and got a job in a radio store. And I worked for, worked for a fellow for a while. And then I got an opportunity to, to uh, leave and go to RCA because RCA was, uh, was hiring. And uh, I went to work for RCA as a television antenna man and service man and telephone man and you name it. And uh, I retired from RCA in 30, for, after 32 years. And I went home and that was it. And now I'm retired. <laughs> and uh, do you have any other questions? Certainly do. <laughs> uh, I ramble on and ramble on. I said that. Well, uh, I think maybe we'll take a short break in a minute and then I'll get to my questions. But All right. One that comes to mind is you were married before you went overseas? No. no. When did you get married? I got married uh, not, all, not long after. I got married in 40, 47. Mm -hmm. Any kids? Yep, got two. And I got a girl and a boy. And the girl is a girl is now works for New York State. She's an administrative law judge. And my son is an is an engineer. He went to RPI, and uh, he works in bar medical up in Glens Falls. And I think we're going to break for a minute because. All right. um, A continuing uh, interview of uh, Mr. Rolton uh, Dubois on the 27th of December. Now, when I was when I was over in, in Andimisk, uh, I had uh, I was on quarters and rations all the time, and I had no no duties at all except my station. And uh, there was three of us there, and, and uh, we we operated the station individually. And I I took the third trick, which was four o'clock to to uh, midnight, and uh, during the day I had all, all day by myself, so I, I uh, inveigled a supply sergeant to let me have some tools and I was making various items, uh, like I made a whole set of uh, candlesticks for the officer's mess, things like that, mm -hmm. and I repaired some equipment, and I, re my, I uh, uh, set up a dark room in, uh, in uh, Actually, set up the dark room and the refrigerator room, actually, and uh, developed some my my prints in there. And uh, while I was there, I needed I needed some kind of transportation other than a, a grabbing a train because there wasn't a train all the time going down that way to my station, which is almost a mile away. And uh, so while I was in the uh, in the Andamish yards, I saw a, an old Norton motorcycle frame laying in the, with no wheels on it. But the motor was uh, there, and the transmission was there, and uh, so I, I went up to the British. The, Brit the British were running the security on everything, and uh, so I, I went to the British lieutenant there, and, uh, and I said, "There's an old motorcycle frame laying out in the yard there," and uh, I said, "I'd like to have it." He says, "I don't know anything about it. If it disappears, I don't know anything about it." <laughs> so it disappeared. I took it over to the roundhouse, and I was friendly with all the people in the roundhouse, and we rebuilt the, the, the motorcycle, we shortened up the frame, we took two trailer, trailer uh, little 10-inch uh, wheels, and uh, we put 10-inch wheels on it, and uh, we welded things together, and, and I put a gas tank on it, there was no gas tank, of course, and uh, I put the gas tank up behind the seat, and uh, put a, a, a box on the front and had a, a scrounge of battery. I used to go over to the to the uh, dump yard that the, the ordnance people had there, and I would pick up tools and I would pick up parts and that. And uh, I built this motorcycle up and I'd go right back and forth to my post on the motorcycle. And uh, uh, the motorcycle, of course, this hot weather, you couldn't use standard kind of oil in it. So I would go to the roundhouse and I would get what they call steam oil. And it's a special consistence oil for hot weather operation. And I put that in my motorcycle. And uh, the gasoline uh, I would get from the motor pool too. And uh, I, I would go over to the ordnance outfit and I would find these tools like an electric drill that had the bit broken off, the tip broken off. I'd find another one and I'd rebuild them into a new good one and I'd trade that for gasoline for <laughs> the motor pool. And uh, 
when I went, when I, when, uh, I was called back to uh, the main post in Alphaz, I took my motorcycle with me. And uh, my captain says, well, you can't have that around the post unless you get permission. And I, I used it all over Andamish with no problem at all. And uh, I uh, wrote up the request to use the motorcycle and everything like that, and it went to the provost marshal. And he sent back a word, not, not approved. Return, return the equipment with its papers <laughs> to the proper sources. No papers, no. And the equipment was junk. So I, uh, I, he said, well, we're leaving the command. You'll have to do something with it. So I got another guy to sign, it, sign off on it, and he took it over. And uh, I left. When I left, I, I was clean. But uh, the... Uh, the, the, the uh, motorcycle didn't last very long because the guy got drunk and, <laughs> and ruined it. But uh, we, uh, we packed up all our stuff after the command was closed and uh, we packed up all our stuff and uh, shipped stuff out to, out and uh, some of the, a lot of the stuff we couldn't, couldn't take with us but we only took very, very important stuff. And we were shipped on Green Project. And this green project, we were a Class A railroad, and we were going to be shipped into Japan to jump into jump into Japan. And during that during that time, I was home on furlough in Japan, and the bomb was dropped. And uh, after that, I, after I got out of the service, why well, I got the radio job, and uh, then I went to RCA. And the only people I knew from the outfit after the war was the company uh, uh, clerk who and I were good, were good friends because he was in photography too. And uh, he came out of the service at the same time I did and uh, he, got, he and I got married about uh, just about the same time. And uh, as a matter of fact, he was my best man. And uh, the, uh, he, I went to work for RCA and he went to work for Kodak. And he, he, he retired from Kodak as the general manager of the uh, Kodak exhibit down in Manhattan. And uh, of course I retired from RCA and I had a lot of other interests in mind. The, 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 I had so many interests, the job was getting in the way. So uh, I went into, uh, of course, my old, my old hobby radio repair and uh, I now collect antique radios and restore them and uh, I collect uh, right now, I have I am restoring an antique Coast Guard radio transmitter and receiver. I have an FCC license, anyway. A Coast Guard transmitter and receiver that was made in 1932 by GE, and uh, I wanted information on it, and I tried to find uh, information from the Coast Guard Museum up in in, Newport, in, in New London. They had nothing on equipment. They had all kinds of badges and flags and all that kind of stuff and boats and things, but nothing on, on any radio equipment. And I put out the word all over in my radio connections and uh, nobody. I finally got a call from a man in, in uh, Kittery, Maine, he said, I've got a transmitter just like yours. He says, but I need information on mine, too. So we swapped information, and I, I'm, I'm swapping information with him on mine. And I found out from him that uh, he got information on, the, on, the, uh, on the, the equipment from the GE Hall of Fame, Hall of Histories down in, in Schenectady. Mm. And uh, the uh, equipment was uh, quite a nice piece of equipment. And uh, another little story, too, uh, after the war, uh, I used to visit down in, the, uh, in, in Schenectady a fair amount of times, and I went by the cultural center down there in, in Schenectady, the museum, and there was a, uh, an RS3 locomotive sitting in their yard. There's a, there's a memorial to the uh, American Locomotive Company. And I said, I had to tell somebody about this. So I went up into the museum and I told the, uh, the head of the museum there, 
I, I have pictures of my the use of locomotives like that over in Iran. Iran? We, we didn't know anything about that. And uh, so uh, I got a call from the uh, from one of the directors of the cultural museum, and uh, she said, "Can I see your pictures?" And I, when I went down there, I showed her, showed her all my pictures and my album and that stuff like that. And I said, I got dozens more photographs. So about a week later, I get a call from her and she says, can I come up and uh, take your negatives and uh, use them? I said, no way, my negatives getting out of my hands. I said, but I got a dark room, any photography work I can do. So she and uh, uh, Joe Meany from the uh, from the, the State Museum came up and they they looked at all my photographs and my and my albums and they gave me information on what pictures they wanted, how big they wanted them and I said, well, I'm, I got to get chemicals for this. So they, so they sent me money and said, go buy the chemicals. So I, I made up all the pictures they wanted and uh, uh, I had a complete wall in the museum of all my photographs and uh, uh, somebody from the uh, military museum came in and I even was surprised to see the 7-Eleven Gaidon they, they, they brought out and uh, they had maps of all of the Iranian railroad with all the pictures of the various places in that map and uh, they even had my my uniform on the, on the glass and uh, they had it set up with nets over the top of it and everything like that. It was a camouflage, and uh, I was I was a key person. I had a 30-foot wall of my my stuff on the wall there, and I put on several talks about it. And uh, all those pictures they gave me they gave me the pictures back. And I've now done uh, talks for the Lions clubs and Rotary clubs and uh, all kinds of things on my experiences in Iran and that. And. Uh, they're, they're still lively memories. And a lot of fellows that I know don't want to know, know anything about their experiences in the war. But I, I was lucky. I, I didn't get into any combat at all. But I could have because I was in the 102nd and they went all through the Pacific. And uh, they, uh, the whole uh, group was... Uh, as a matter of fact, the first sergeant in the 102nd uh, was uh, uh, John McGuigan, who was in was a sergeant in World War One, and he stayed in the military in the, in the guard, and uh, he was in the, he was, he was the first sergeant in the 102nd uh, during the time we were in the war. And uh, I met John after the after the war, and uh, we were all, went to Camp Smith for a group picnic, and that and we had a lot of old times to talk about. And even his son was in, the, in with him. And uh, that's about it. Well, that's a good point to transition back. All right. And I want to start again with uh, your entry into the one of second engineers. Why did you join the one of second engineers? Well, I joined them basically basically because uh, my father's boss, who was a first sergeant. And, and master sergeant in, the, in World War One, and uh, he always talked about the war and everything like that. And uh, uh, I hung around the, the, the shop where my father worked a lot, and it was an they were automobile mechanics, and uh, we knew the war was coming on somehow uh, in, in 1940. We knew something was happening, and uh, so he said, "Look, he says." Why bother getting drafted? Why don't you join in what you want to be in? So he said, why don't you join the 102nd Engineer Group, where I was? And uh, so I went down and a friend of mine joined, the, a friend of mine, and he, he and I both joined the 102nd Engineers. And uh, we were in the, we were on a, we drilled on a drill floor for a week and then we got shipped out. And when we went down to Alabama, uh, we were all standing in line and uh, the colonel, somebody make a noise. The colonel calls out my name. So we we drilled for for a week and then we were re-alerted. And while we were down in in, 
in Alabama, my name was called in the line. He says, step out. And I stepped out of the line. He says, the man says, I'm Colonel Bremser. He says, I served with your, with your, 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 your father's friend, Gus Wiedemann. And he said, uh, he saved my life. <laughs> so, and Gus Wiedemann uh, uh, had saved his life and, uh, and, uh, and uh, all the guys around me looking, who's this guy? Got these connections. <laughs> he was with a PFC. And uh, so uh, uh, another uh, captain, Captain Gormson, who had also been in that group. Turn it off. Well, we can keep bouncing back yeah, and forth. Yeah, all right. And uh, Colonel Gormson, or Captain Gormson, was, was in that group. Too. And they all shook my hands and said, glad to have you here, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, that, that, that didn't do me any good anyway. <laughs> that was it. What kind of unit did you think you were joining when you joined the engineers? Did it have any kind of reputation? All I know is it combat engineers. Mm -hmm. That's all. And I was not interested in infantry or anything like that. I was, I was more interested in... Did you know that they were about to be federalized when you joined? No. No. What kind of reception did you get when you first came to the armory? What was it like? The big army? Yeah. I mean, when you walked in, what did they... You know, what was your reaction? How did they treat you? Oh, they, they, they took me up into a room and uh, gave me a physical and, uh, and uh, urine, urine test and all that kind of stuff. And the first first time I uh, I uh, was there, first day I was there, they, they rejected me. Too much albumin in the urine. Mm. So uh, I said, "What? what, what How's that?" And they said, "Well, he says come back ne tomorrow." So I went back the next day and uh, tested out okay, and signed up. And uh, then after we got down to Alabama, where we was all kinds of we did all kinds of work. The first week when you were in the armory, did they issue you uniforms or? They, uh, they, they, uh, they didn't issue us any uniforms then, uh, but uh, about just before we were, were alerted, they issued some uniforms. And uh, we had, we drilled in the National Guard uh, red coats, the old, the old uh, uniforms that they had at one time. Well, the dress uniforms. Of the dress record. uniforms, yeah. And we drilled in the dress uniforms, and then after that they gave us the regular khaki stuff. And what about, uh, did they give you rifles to drill with? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, they had, they had rifles. That they, they, were, they were issued there, but we didn't take them anywhere. They were issued there. And, uh, did well, you go home at night? or did you Oh yeah, we went home or? at night. Yeah, we went home at night for that week. Mm -hmm. And uh, every day we had to go down there. And uh, from East Chester all the way down to the Bronx was <laughs> the trip on a train, that's all. And uh, when they federalized us, why, uh, they gave us uh, rifles and uh, we marched down the street and went into Grand Central Terminal and got on the train and, and uh, we went out to Cincinnati and then, then down on the, on the Missouri Pacific from there. And uh, to, uh, not the Missouri Pacific, because there. Uh, Forgot what the railroad was. Anyway, took us into Anniston, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Any special send off for the regiment when you left? No, no special send off. There's a whole lot of mothers out there at the Grand Central Terminal hollering and yelling to their kids. That's about all. But there was no special send off. And uh, when we came back, there was no special come back either. We just came back and happy to get home. So, what was your life like in Anniston, Fort McClellan? Uh, it was tense, and uh, we had uh, we, we had basic training and all that kind of stuff, troop training, a lot of things, and uh, we we lear learned our rifles and uh, uh, we we uh, I field stripped my rifle down a couple of times, and took the stock off and everything, and cleaned it all up, and had a nice a nice new nice clean rifle after the Cosmoline, and uh, <laughs> the captain gave me a whole yell for taking his field strip and they had gone down too, too far. And uh, I was familiar with guns anyway because my father was a game warden for years. And, and uh, so after we went into, into uh, the maneuvers, before we went into maneuvers we had, uh, we had uh, I was in the motor pool and uh, 
I was, I was classified as an ignition specialist and I was in charge of taking care of the timing on the, on the trucks and uh, 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 the uh, electrical equipment. And uh, I had a big argument with the, with the, uh, the, with the guys. The driver's, the driver's duty was to, to, to change the battery if the battery was bad or anything like that. And they, they were putting them in backwards. And uh, they were discharging the batteries like crazy. And of course, they're coming back for a new battery. And uh, I went to the captain and I said, I said, these guys are ruining these batteries. I said, they're putting them in backwards. And uh, the lieutenant in charge of the motor pool says, that don't make any difference. All I got to do is change the ampere meter. <laughs> and uh, I drew all kinds of pictures and uh, that of batteries and electronics and that stuff, kind of stuff. Next thing I get transferred to A company, from A, com a company to headquarters company. And headquarters company, I was switchboard operator and KP duty and you name it. What, we went, what did you think of your officers and sergeants? Oh, they were, they were all right. We had no problem. Uh, we, we had, uh, we had a couple of uh, staff sergeants that were kind of stuffy characters, but uh, <laughs> the officers mostly uh, didn't have any uh, any difficulties, and uh, they were regular guys. And uh, I, I had a good in with them because I was repairing their radio equipment for them too. They had their own ham, their own radio, regular radios. They put up antennas on. The, on their tents and stuff like that. They seem like they were competent. Uh, they were national guarders from from the from the from the thirties, and a lot of them were were some of them were World War One guys. The officers, most of the officers, were World War One guys. Uh, there were some younger officers in there that had made their grade in the in the guards, but. Uh, most of the uh, non-coms were regular guys. There was no difficulty with them, and uh, there were no problems. You spent a lot of time in the field at uh, Fort McClellan. Yeah, yeah. We we had a, a just outside the camp was a, a large area that we we uh, maneuvered in, and uh, we went out there. The combat engineer group. We had a train on how to build uh, wood bridges. We chopped down trees and we built wood bridges, and. Uh, put up uh, bridges strong enough to take a tank across. And uh, we uh, forded, forded rivers with, uh, with boats. We, had, uh, we, we, put up, we put up ponton boats across a couple of the rivers. And uh, we had uh, whole teams of guys carrying <coughs> bulks and beams to put these uh, ponton boat, uh, bridge across these ponton boats. <clears throat> Any particular equipment or personnel shortages or problems? No, not that I know of. We had some draftees in there that didn't like the idea. <laughs> that was about it. Of course, I was an enlistee, for I was I was not uh, considered a, one of the guys. I, I I had enlisted, so I I could suffer for it. But the 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 rest of the the rest of the situation, there was no no problems in the field. And. Uh, what about uh, your off hours? Did you have time for recreation? What did you oh yeah, we could go into town. Right? We had we had a pass to go into town and all that kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of times we went into town, and Anniston was just a little dirt town, dirt street town practically. And uh, a lot of the stores had had uh, signs in the windows: "Soldiers and dogs not allowed" in the stores. Uh, the problem was the Fifth Army had been down there during the, the during the thirties. And they were apparently a, a bunch of tough guys, and uh, the women weren't safe, and uh, the stores were being robbed of shoplifting and all that kind of stuff from the, some of these guys in the Fifth Army. So they, they had an animosity towards a lot of the military. But uh, the, a lot of, some of the people weren't. And there was one, one place there I still remember. Uh, there was a, a sort of a boarding house affair or, or, or public public restaurant. And it wasn't really a restaurant where you had uh, uh, waiters or anything, waitresses or anything like that. It was one big long table. And this big long table uh, everybody in town sat at. And uh, I would go in and uh, the mayor would be there or uh, the, the, uh, the police officer or on, on the other side of me and half a dozen farmers and people like that. And we'd all hand 
food back and forth and, and have dinner. And we paid two dollars for that. And it was a, a, a woman was operating this place at the, the, the restaurant. The kind of a community affair. And uh, everybody, the mayor and everybody would talk and, and uh, one of the guys, one of the guys looked at looked at my my cap with the with the railroad on. He said, "Oh, you're a railroad guy, huh? You must be a tough bastard." <laughs> but most of us, most of us railroad guys were were ordinary guys, and uh, uh, the, most of the railroad fellows were uh, switchmen and brakemen and uh, conductors and engineers from all different railroads in in the in the country, and. Uh, uh, we had uh, fellows who were, who were uh, telegraph operators on, on some of the railroads. We had one, one fellow, they called him Suitcase Simpson because he, he was what they call a railroad boomer. And uh, he would go out on various tours and uh, he would fill in uh, on telegraph stations where they needed a telegraph operator. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the bunch of guys it was all, all worked together. We didn't have any, any difficulties. So, what was it like uh, on the uh, Tennessee maneuvers? On the Tennessee maneuvers, well, we, we, we hiked through a lot of places. We, drove, we rode on trucks through a lot of places. And uh, at that particular time, we were working with the horse cavalry people before they, got, uh, before they were mechanized. And uh, a lot of the horse cavalry people were coming through the area where we were. And uh, we were afraid. We were afraid the horses would step on us. So we talked to a couple of the cavalry people and said, "Don't worry about it. Either you're laying on the ground, a horse won't step on you." And uh, he says, it's, "It's one of those things that a horse won't do." And uh, well, we slept in the, we slept in tents. We had a, a regular Army World War One type of pup tents. And uh, we, one time, I experienced a, a, something. We. We were trying to put up an officer, our, our officer's tent, and he had a regular big fly tent. You try to try to drive stakes in the ground in the dark, and you can't see. We were in the woods. Every time we were every time we were deactivated, we were in woods, and uh, we uh, we we put up these tents, and then the next morning you you realize how lousy the job was of putting up the tents in the dark. And we moved all over the uh, all over, all over Louisiana and Tennessee, and uh, we had uh, various places where we met. One time we uh, one time when we were in in, uh, in uh, Manchester, Tennessee, uh, we were camped in the parade grounds, and uh, the people came out and gave us food and all kinds of stuff, extra goodies and all that kind of stuff, and. Uh, they invited us to swim in the creek that was just down the road, and it was a great big sandy beach and a place where we could go swimming. And we stripped off to nothing and went to went swimming. And uh, uh, the maneuvers the maneuvers were not a, a real tough situation. And uh, I transferred around to various places because I, I don't know, I, I guess I had more ability than some of the guys, and some of the guys had. Uh, uh, Never knew how to, learn, to drive a truck because they were New York City guys. Most of the most of the members of the outfit were New York City guys in the in the Tennessee maneuvers. And uh, I went out to a farm farmyard one time, milked a cow, got some fresh milk. <laughs> and and uh, while I was while I was out there, I uh, I, uh, I I borrowed the man's horse, and I rode I rode down the road on a on a saddle horse, and. Uh, I get down the road a ways, and here the command car comes along, with uh, full of officers, and uh, <coughs> they were coming opposite me, and the guy was standing. The guy, the, the driver of the car was revving up his motor as he stopped. He revving up the motor, and every time he did it, that horse would shiver, and I couldn't get that doggone horse to go off, get off the side of the road, and finally uh, I got him off the side of the road, and the command car took off and went. You know, and uh, I turned the horse around and I let him go and he ran back to the stable and uh, that was it. And I got off and that was, that was enough horse riding for me. So Louisiana uh, maneuvers, were they much the same as the Much Tennessee? the same, yeah. I went out, when I went out to Louisiana, when I, on a tour to get to Louisiana, 
uh, I was a, a, a tagline driver on a truck uh, that was being towed by a Diamond T. And this truck, this truck uh, they, it didn't have the stamina to take the long trip, so they, they towed it out there. And I was a steerer in that, in that truck, and I, I followed the Diamond T all the way across, <laughs> all the way across, across to Louisiana. Did you think it was realistic training? Uh, well, it wasn't. I, I don't know whether it was really <coughs> training or not, but it was. It was. Uh, it was another experience of being, being, uh, on your own, as it were. But uh, the way the, uh, the the training was was mostly, mostly uh, how to hide and uh, where to, where to keep out of sight and all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, I drove a, a, a truck on a on a convoy one time where we had uh, the first truck only had had the lights headlights on, and the rear the, all the other trucks had two little lights, and you had a, a, a circle on the windshield, and you're supposed to keep those two little lights within those circles. If they got too close, you got too close, the lights overcovered the spots, and if you got too far away, it was too small, and they got into the center of the spot. So it was convoy driving. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you do that anymore anymore. But uh, that was some of the things we did in Louisiana and Tennessee. How, being from a um, small town upstate New York, yeah. how did you get along with the New York City guys? All right. No, no, no difficulty with the New York City guys. There was no, some of them, some of them uh, were draftees, and uh, they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't fraternize much with me because I was a dra I was, I was an enlisty, uh, but that was about it. They, the the uh, non-coms were all guard, regular guard guys, and uh, uh, John McGuigan's John McGuigan was first sergeant, and. Uh, his son was a uh, was a staff sergeant in the outfit. And then you were transferred to uh, the well. Mill. After I got out on a one year enlistment, mm -hmm. I, I uh, re-enlisted in the reserves, and uh, that put me on an unassigned list, and they could send me anywhere I wanted. And that outfit, the 102nd, went out to uh, Stockton, California, and uh, they uh, shipped out from there into the all the, all of the islands, and they ended up in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And you ended up uh, with the 7-Eleven down in, in Camp Claiborne initially. Yeah. The railway you built between Camp Claiborne and Camp Polk, is it still there? Do you know? Uh, as far as I know, it's not there anymore. It's been mostly torn up. And uh, it, for after we finished with the railroad, we built it. After we finished it, it became a training railroad for other uh, railroad battalions. And uh, there, there are there are pictures of various. Uh, troops riding the trains and jumping off the trains and hiding in the brushes when an airplane went by, all that kind of training program. We didn't have that when we were building the railroad. You said that you saw a diesel one day and it was in a desert kind of camouflage? Yeah. And it was because it was a paint, painted in a desert camouflage you thought you must be going to the desert? Yeah. We thought we might go to North Africa, but uh, we didn't know where we were going to go. And uh, North Africa was, of course, by that time had already been finished. But uh, we 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 learned through the grapevine that we were going to Iran. As a matter of fact, one of the fellows called up his wife and said, "We're going to Iran," <laughs> which was against the rules. Did you ever feel like uh, you had sort of been isolated or out of the main action when you were in Iran, sort of been a forgotten theater? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, it was forgotten here, I guess, but uh, uh, the, New York, uh, the New York Times, I think, had a story uh, later on. In 1943, the National Geographic had a complete layout on the, the operation in Iran. And uh, I have a copy of that, that, that issue. And uh, they told about the locomotives and how the, the, the group was formed up in Fort Belvoir. It formed up in Fel Fort Belvoir because of the fact that uh, it was probably the nearest thing to Washington then. And uh, they were supposed to train on the, on the uh, little uh, narrow-gauge Akatink Railroad in Fort Belvoir. And they found out that 
that was inadequate for the operations where we were expected to do. So they shipped us down to Louisiana. I joined them in Louisiana. I, I wasn't in Fort Belmore. I joined them in Louisiana. Did you have much dealings with the Russians when you were over there? Oh, yeah. What was that like? The Russian troops would come down on a train and they would guard the trains as they went back up north. And uh, in the uh, Koramshai yards, when they made up the trains, they, the guards were put on them, and uh, the Russian guards were put on them, and they rode the trains in the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, what they call the, the switchman's car, switchman's box. They didn't have uh, caboose on most of those trains. They had what they call a switchman's box, which was a little telephone booth on the front end of each, each uh, box car. And uh, this telephone booth, these guards would sit in there and, and guard the train all the way up. And we had, we had trouble with them once in a while. We had uh, one train had ba had bad wheels on it, and uh, uh, we wanted to take that car out of the, of the train. And the guards wouldn't let us, and uh, we, had to, we, had to, we had to get the, the Russian officers in there and explain to them that the, the wheel was bad and that the train wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go without that, with that bad wheel. And so they, they finally let us do it. And a couple of times we said to hell with you and let them, let them take it out. If they want it that way, let them take it out. And of course, the wheel went bad on the, on the road. And they had to be towed back in again. But uh, we had trouble with the British later on uh, where we were closing down the command because uh, we were taking, we, we had company equipment. All of that, the, the, we had uh, a, a whole number of box cars, flat cars, locomotives, and and uh, equipment like that, that were company equipment that were brought over there specifically for us. And uh, when we were taking them down, we were we were uh, welding, uh, brazing out the uh, the rivets and uh, flattening them down, so that we could we could ship them. And the British came in and said that, uh, no, 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 you can't take that, you can't take that. This is land lease material. Finish. Oh, we got a couple more minutes. All right. This is lead lease material, and uh, our officer said, "Heck no! That's our our material. This is company equipment." And uh, apparently, the British officer pulled a gun on ours, and uh, that set up an international conference, and uh, the British officer suddenly disappeared. <laughs> well, since we only have a, a few more minutes, let me ask you, looking back. Are you proud of what you did? Yeah. That's why I keep all the memorial uh, of it. Uh, we, think we, uh, we think we saved a, a lot of American lives in, uh, in uh, Europe because the Russians were taking care of the, the Germans. And uh, we, provided, we provided supplies for a second front. Is, is there any way that uh, comes to mind that uh, your experiences in the military changed your life more than any other way? I learned a lot of uh, things about uh, other countries and other people. And uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to get, to get a job on the railroad, but uh, they, they turned me down because I was, I was too lightly built. I only weighed 127 pounds when I came back. And uh, uh, I wanted to get on the railway, railway police, but uh, 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 they, they turned me down. So I, I went, to, uh, went into a radio store and I got a job with a, with a fellow that I, that I went to school with. One last thing. Um, you were awarded a decoration by the Soviet government? Yeah, I was, I was given a, a, a decoration by the federal government, the British Russian government. Uh, I found out about it from a merchant marine who told me that they were giving me out and I, I sent in my credentials to uh, the Russian embassy in, in Washington, and uh, they sent me back uh, this medal. Can we see it? Sure. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, the only thing I the only thing I uh, I have to say about it is. Uh, I rather enjoyed what I was doing over there. Uh, I had no difficulties with anything. 
and uh, uh, I wasn't in combat. And uh, I was lucky though because uh, the circumstances uh, took me out of combat because I re-enlisted in the reserves. Because I, I think otherwise I would have gone back into into some other some other outfit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Finish. Yep, I think so.